Now, it's always very gratifying when a, a lecturer actually wants to come back to the LAS <laughs> to give a talk. Um, you may remember that um, John gave us a talk last year in October about interstellar objects. Um, he, you may remember, started his astronomical career by reading Dan Dare. Now, I understand he hasn't yet found any Mekons, but I, he's still working, <laughs> apparently. Um, but tonight, he's going to talk to us about um, the concepts and challenges of interstellar probes. So, um, can we all give an LAS welcome to John Davis? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, let me just do my share screen. I hope this works because I still really haven't got on top of Zoom, I'm afraid. Uh, and there, I share it. Oh, I go to present mode. It behaves itself. Thank you. Okay, so can everybody see concepts and challenges of interstellar probes? We can. Yep. How can we do it? Yep. With our two logos. Yeah, and I'm John Davis. Um, I'm not one of the, the, the big gurus in, in I4IS. Uh, we have people who write peer reviewed papers and that sort of stuff, but uh, I'm, I'm, I regard myself as a, as a humble. Uh, technical journalist in this con context. I'm, a, I'm a, a software engineer by original trade. Um, well, an electronics en engineer before that. Um, but I've got a reasonable grasp on it and, uh, and hopefully um, I'll be able to uh, take you through this. And you'll notice we've got two logos. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that at the end, but we are definitely, we have two identities for sort of legal and regulatory reasons. Um, but in the UK, we're the Initiative for Interstellar Studies. So this is about um, how can we do it? That, that's the, re the real questions on the right hand side. And um, here's what our business is. We're, we're, that's our slogan. Foster and promote education, knowledge, technical capabilities. We need to design technologies or enterprise that will enable the construction and launch of interstellar spacecraft. Um, and we've been around since 2012. Um, incorporated formally in both the UK and the USA in 2014. Uh, and I joined within a month or so of, of the organisation being founded. Um, and it all grows out originally out of something called the British Interplanetary Society, which some of you may have heard of. Um, and we'll get to some of the work they did um, and have done uh, in a minute. So here's the scale of the problem. This is a very nice graphic from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And we'll say a bit more about them. And, and that's by Pontus Brandt, who's the sort of second in command to uh, uh, Ralph McNutt, who's the gaffer at uh, JHU APL. Um, and what it's showing you is, is the scale of the problem. And it's a, it's, a, it's a logarithmic scale. So you can see one astronomical unit to the left there distance between the sun and the earth. Um, now one step along you get Saturn, which is uh, 10 to the power one, i.e. just 10 astronomical units away. Um, you then get to uh, roughly the termination shock of, uh, the inner bit of the, of the helio heliosphere, um, or the shell anyway, and that's uh, um, 10 cubed. Uh, you start to get out way beyond the Kuiper belt, but not quite into the Oort cloud at, at, uh, at uh, 10 to the 3, 1000 AU. Um, and we can now start to talk about uh, uh, light years because the next one, 10 to the 4th, is, is uh, um, well, it's basically 57.8, say, say 60 light days. Um, um, and then we get to at the next multiple of 10, um, we get uh, 1.5, one basically one and a half light years. And the, the next uh, astronomical scale of things, uh, you, you've actually got beyond Alpha Centauri, the, the, the nearest star system to ours, uh, at 15.8 light years. So it's one of the problems with a logarithmic scale. 
uh, I'll just uh, tame it down a bit by showing you a, a, a simpler diagram showing the same thing. Uh, this is a rather cruder thing. Um, and again, it's a log scale of astronomical units. So Earth, Saturn, out at the heliopause, uh, somewhere in between, somewhere in the in the Oort cloud where all the long period comets come from, um, and then uh, uh, out Alpha Centauri there at around four light light years away. Um, and you could say that is a very long way. That is, um, how can we ever do it? Well, the lesson. Uh, I think we should we should learn from our own um, history as human beings and what we can achieve is is the hundred years basically between um, the right flyer and the international a little bit of uh, uh, hanging around on the moon in between within a hundred years we got from not being able to fly at all to having a permanent habitat in space and having been to the moon that looks like we're going back very soon as well. So in 100 years, it's mind boggling what, what uh, human science and technology can achieve. Um, oh yeah, and there's dear old Sputnik in the middle there. Uh, um, there might even be some people here old enough as I am to remember when Sputnik went up, but I was quite young. I was just a kid. Um, Here's, here's a, another scale. This is a, um, a diagram by uh, uh, an Italian prop called Claudio Marconi, um, who's been very prominent in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence for donkey's years. I think he's, he's even older than I am. Um, uh, and he's, he's one of the key international drivers of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a mega brain. Um, and uh, um, this diagram comes from a, a Tau Zero Foundation, which is another of the, there's about four or five organizations around the world doing a serious, serious study on, on interstellar probes, and they're one of them. Um, they did a breakthrough propulsion study for NASA back in 28, uh, and they lifted this diagram of Claudio Marconi's, um, which he presented at the International Astronautical Congress in Glasgow in 2008. Um, and what it's telling you is is that um, first of all you need a log scale in both axes you need you need a log scale of of time transit time and you need a log scale of distance and and with that log scale you can uh, uh, encompass the difference between where we are and the radius of the galaxy at the right hand side um, and the, the horizontal lines represent velocities and clearly um, without uh, Star Trek technology we can't go faster than light so that, that right hand diagonal is, is an absolute limit but maybe we can get to a tenth or even 20% uh, of the speed of light I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Claudio McCone is on our advisory council um, he's, he's been very supportive of what we've done um, uh, and he's a, he's a, a, a real uh, brilliant guy in the subject. Uh, met him a couple of times at International Astronautical Congress, more recent than that, um, than that 2008 one. So there's two ways to go. This is the heavy way. Uh, I don't know, is anybody familiar with uh, the Solikovsky rocket equation? Maybe, maybe some people are. If you want to unmute yourself and say yes. Uh, Anybody seen it before? No? Nope. No volunteers. Okay. No. Uh, it's a direct consequence of Newton's second law. Um, uh, if you think about it, if you uh, uh, twiddle around with, with Newton's second law, of course, equals mass times acceleration, you, you'll see that acceleration equals force over mass. Uh, and what Tsiolkovsky did was he just integrated it. So integrate acceleration to get the total amount of, of velocity change you get from a certain amount of fuel that you chuck out the back of your rocket. Um, so acceleration is equals force over mass. Um, integrate the, the left hand side to get a uh, uh, velocity change. You know, acceleration times time equals velocity. 
integrate the force over mass bit on the on the on the right hand side. The force basically comes from the exhaust velocity, which is the VE term, and the one over mass uh, uh, turns into by the straight indefinite integral that one over x equals natural log of x uh, turns itself into the mass ratio. So uh, the uh, um, mass original and the mass final of the rocket. So uh, the, the the more of the of the mass of the rocket you you can actually throw out the back of it, the greater the velocity. Um, and sort of separate subject, but that's part of the reason why every rocket that's, that's ever uh, gone into even low Earth orbit has been a multi-stage rocket. Because when, you, when you've used up the fuel, when it, you want to throw away all that useless structure and, and carry on with, with a much less um, dead weight mass, basically, because everything's dead weight. And in the end, what you're trying to do is put the probe into orbit or even further. Um, and Konstantin Edvardovich Solkovsky worked this out in the early um, years of the last century. And he did lots of other things too. Um, he, he was a remarkable visionary. Uh, um, fortunately for him, he died in 1935. So before the Stalin purges, he, he just got, he just made it into the, into the Soviet area. But he, he, uh, he's a big hero in Russia, but uh, I suspect he, he might have fallen foul of the authorities if he, if he lasted more than a few years longer. Um, uh, one of my heroes, actually. Um, and the critical thing is exhaust velocity, or as rocket engineers tend to put it, specific impulse. It's the same thing. You get what from one to the other by multiplying by the gravitational constant. Um, uh, and the, the key thing is, is that you can't get much exhaust velocity from chemical propellants, which is pretty much all we have for big rockets. Um, we have um, iron propulsion, but we only use that uh, for relatively low uh, thrusts for things like attitude control on satellites. And it's much more efficient, but you can't scale it up um, to, to the sort of force you get out of a, out of a chemical rocket. Um, plasma you can do rather better, um, and there are some ideas for scaling that up, but not much implemented yet. Um, fission you get a bit more, and, and ideas for fission rockets have, have started to surface again, and there's some experiments done in the 60s and 70s by NASA, um, and there is some idea that we can, we can run missions to Mars much more quickly and efficiently if, if we use uh, nuclear fission propulsion, but it's still not really up to much. You're trying to really go some. Uh, fusion started to look a lot more promising, but of course, um, fusion's always 10 years away, as we all know. Um, antimatter, well, terrific if you can make enough of it, um, but nobody's made, I don't think anybody's even made some anti hydrogen. You only need an electron, the proton, to do that, but um, maybe they have, but it'd be very expensive to make any significant amount of, of antimatter. So that's not really practical. So th those are the constraints that you have. Um, what can you what can you do um, in terms of the efficiency of a, of a conventional rocket? But there is another way. Um, you don't have to carry the propellant with you. You can get the, the the propulsion from an external device, and in this case, a laser. Um, and uh, Solar, solar sailing has already been proved. There's a, there's a Japanese satellite that went up uh, some time ago that, that um, was did some um, in solar system exploration called Icaros, and that used a solar sail. So it was using solar photons, basically. Um, and the Planetary Society in the USA have got an experimental low Earth orbit satellite that uses a light sail. Uh, I think their light sail one failed, and it's light sail two. But the serious work on this, the first serious work, although Sialkowski did think about it, but the first serious work was by Robert um, Forward, um, Hughes Corporation, uh, back in the 1980s. Um, and it's been tested in vacuum chambers, but not yet demonstrated in space. And I'll get to that a little bit in a little while. Robert Forward's equation from his famous paper, his 1984 paper. Um, and it's, it's, as simple really as Sarkovsky's rocket equation. What it says is the acceleration you get with a vehicle of mass m 
and a reflectance of, I think that's, I can never remember my Greek letters. Anyway, reflectance, a certain reflectance, and an incident laser power of P is that. And the real uh, sort of uh, uh, fly in the ointment is, is uh, that C on the bottom of the fraction. C is the velocity of light, which is a bloody big number. So you need a hell of a lot of that P power. You need absolutely perfect reflection. And you want to keep the mass down way, 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 way down. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to get very much acceleration. And the consequences of that will um, become clear fairly soon. Um, so that's the, the two basic equations, the Sarkovsky rocket equation, if you want to chop things out the back like a rocket, uh, and Robert Forward's uh, uh, light sail equation, if, you, if you're using a laser or, or solar photons for that matter. Um, there are some ways that are impossible so far. Um, uh, really, really powerful rockets. Antimatter, I've already mentioned. Uh, Einstein uh, first postulated anti antimatter, I think. I don't know whether he ever thought about using the pro propulsion, but he was a physicist, not an engineer. Um, Gene Roddenberry, of course, because uh, the, the antimatter pods on the Starship Enterprise are, are what allows it to do its spacewalk. I mean, there's, there's some real, um, how shall I put it? Um, no, bullshit. Let's <laughs> let's not let's not, uh, let's not mince words. Um, you can actually, in principle, use a, a, a ramjet. Uh, a, a guy, a guy named Robert Buzzard um, uh, proposed that you could use the um, the material in the interstellar medium as your propellant. In which case, it operates like a sort of jet engine. Um, you squeeze the interstellar medium material and uh, achieve fusion and put it out the back. Um, unfortunately, the physics doesn't work very well. Um, there are still some ideas about how it might be made to work. Uh, you could use a black hole. Black holes are very good. You chuck, you chuck matter into them and, and they radiate lots of energy. Um, but first catch your black hole. Um, um, space warps. Um, and a, uh, a Mexican guy called Miguel Alcubierre uh, was doing his PhD at Cardiff University, strangely enough, and he wrote a, uh, a, a paper back in 1994, Warp Drive Hyperfast Travel Within General Relativity. And he proved, in the equations at least, that, that if you could create the right sort of matter in vast quantities, you could actually warp space, uh, just like Star Trek. Um, the, the numbers are absolutely mind boggling, so it's not going to happen soon. There's no possibility of that. But it's an intriguing idea. And that's the paper. That's a, um, as always, my, my references are all to, to uh, open sources. They're not paywalled, um, like a lot of academic papers are. Um, you can use a, um, a wormhole. And that was something that Einstein um, talked about. The, an einstein rosen bridge was first discussed in a paper by those two guys back in the 1930s. And of course, uh, we, we've all seen the film, or most of us have seen the film Interstellar, which postulates a wormhole as a way of getting to um, somewhere a long way from the solar system. And Kip Thorne, who's the emeritus uh, uh, Feynman professor of physics at Caltech, um, was an advisor on that film, and he thinks it's possible. So if the Feynman professor of physics at Caltech thinks it might be possible, then I think it probably is possible, but not, not in the near future. Um, if we can only go slowly, then maybe we need world ships. Uh, we need to create a whole uh, human um, um, living space uh, inside a vehicle. Um, and people live in it for generations. And lots of science fiction about that, of course. Um, most of it rather gloomy. Um, but again, uh, um, you know, far future stuff. But uh, I fry is quite interesting. Um, artificial general intelligence is uh, sort of my own favourite, um, and I'll, I'll get to that um, in a minute. So let's look back at rockets. Here's a Saturn V with some people sitting at the bottom of it to show you how big it is. 
And the thing on the right is the is the equivalent Russian vehicle that never worked. It kept blowing up, up in the end. Um, uh, the the uh, um, the exhibition at the Science Museum just a few years ago um, actually showed the Russian Lem. They they actually managed to get it from from Russia, and it was a, a very weird looking vehicle. I mean, you think that the the lot the, the Apollo uh, program Lem was pretty weird. The the, uh, the Russian lambs even weirder, um, and it was it was a a, a one man vehicle, uh, and it was going to sit at the top of this dirty great thing here. Um, but you know, three and a half thousand tons launch mass, and, and most of that is fuel. So that's the scale of things, even just to get to the moon. Here's what. Um, a bunch of guys at the British Interplanetary Society came up with in, in the 1970s, um, led by uh, Alan Bond and Tony Martin, um, who incidentally went on to found reaction engines, who, who were looking at uh, air breathing rockets as a way of getting into orbit um, relatively inexpensively. But that's another story. And basically, what they uh, proposed, and there was a whole team of them. Um, based at the BIS, particularly nuclear engineers, um, physicists, um, and they thought about using a, a, a pellets of deuterium. Um, and if you could mine the right sort of deuterium, um, and it's not very readily available, that's another story, if you could mine the right sort of deuterium, um, Encapsulate it into pellets, into little little pellets, um, and then inject them into a space where you could fire uh, beams at it. Very very powerful beams. They talked about electron beams. The facility in the USA, the the, the um, nationally ignition facility in California, actually uses laser beams. And what they're trying to do is that they've got these little pellets. Uh, just as it by, by the BIS people back in the 80s. They fire one into this chamber and they, they, they bombard it with these monstrous lasers and hope to achieve fusion. And they've not really achieved uh, um, any kind of, of self-sustaining fusion reaction yet. They're still working on it. Um, so this, was a, this is a two-stage rocket basically built in space. Um, and two-stage for the same uh, rocket equation, Salkowski reasons throw away the bit you, you, you've used up when it runs out of fuel. Um, we're talking about a 50,000 ton vehicle here, so a massive vehicle, and a 500 ton payload at the front. Um, and uh, I can say a lot more about Daedalus, and, and uh, it, it's worth looking up. And I've, I've given a reference to the BIS boot that collects all the papers. It's, it's, a, it's a really uh, magnificent piece of work. A bunch of guys basically in the spare time, professionals, but but nevertheless in their spare time. And it's still the most refined design for, for, a, um, for a, an interstellar probe all these years later. And here's the scale of it alongside a Saturn V, of course it would never sit on the Earth's surface, but it's, it's, it's a, a big thing. And there is a successor to Daedalus, which is um, the, the Icarus uh, program, also initiated by the BIS, but including a couple of American organizations as well. Uh, and they've come up with a number of, of solutions to the, to the same basic problem, which is build a fusion rocket to get to the nearest star. And they set themselves a, 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 a rather uh, less constrained uh, journey time of around 100 years, but a more constrained objective in the sense that they weren't just going to do a flyby at a big percent of the speed of light, 12% uh, in the case of the Douglas probe. Um, they, they were going to fly at, at, at a speed of that sort of order, and then they were going to slow down at the other end. And of course, that is exactly the same challenge. You've got less mass because you've burned up quite a lot of it. But nevertheless, it's a very substantial challenge slowing down from the sort of speeds you need to get there in any reasonable time uh, for light years. Um, and this uses something called Z-pinch or Z-pinch being one of them is an American guy, the other is French Canadian, the two project leaders. Um, and this uh, diagram is by the French Canadian uh, 
engineer, Michel Amontagne, great bloke. Um, and they use something called Z-Pinch, which is a, 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 one of the possible ways of achieving control of fusion. Um, and there is there are experimental reactors that don't again don't quite work in, in the USA that you, that use Z pinch as a way of power generation, and it relies on the fact that a, a, a powerful enough current produces a very strong inward magnetic force. If you think about the lines of force around a current carrying conductor; they 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 they're, they're basically circular around the conductor, and they they produce a compressive force. And if your current's strong enough, then the compression is sufficient to produce fusion. That's how a Z-pinch works. And uh, the other way, of course, is not to use a rocket, but to use laser sails. And here's where I4IS comes in. Uh, we had done some work, a, a, um, a student competition called uh, um, Project Dragonfly uh, back in uh, 2014. Um, and the guys who are about to, to uh, launch Breakthrough Starshot, which I'll tell you a bit about more about in, in a moment. One of the guys bumped into one of our co-founders at, at the conference in California just before the Breakthrough Starshot launch and, and said, you guys have done some work on this. Can you can you do as a design study? Um, and as it says there, this was three days. Um, got the guys together. I, my part of this was very, very limited. Um, uh, much smarter guys at this sort of technology. And they proposed uh, uh, that you would need about one gigawatts of laser in, in, the, in space. You'd accept a 50 year flight time and a 10% of speed of light cruise velocity. Um, and you'd only have a few grams and you'd have a very small radioisotope thermal generator, an RTG, just like New Horizons and Voyagers and all those things. They all use an RTG um, for power. Um, so that was input into the, into the uh, uh, Breakthrough Starshot project. Um, and that was actually launched. Uh, it was launched with funding from a, um, an internet billionaire called Yuri Milner in 2016. And Stephen Hawking was there at the launch. You can see in there in that picture with Yuri, Yuri uh, Milner at the podium. Uh, the exec di director is, is Pete Warden. He's ex-director of NASA Ames. Um, chair of the advisory board is, is Abby Loeb. Um, has become a bit notorious recently with his theories about Oumuamua, but we'll, we'll move on from that. Um, I think we've already discussed that. But other people were on the advisory board were um, our co-founder, Kelvin Long, um, Freeman Dyson, um, uh, another amazing guy, no time to talk about him now, and the astronomer royal, Martin Rees. So that started. Um, what we've been doing in our own small corner is 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 the idea of a demonstrator of laser push because it's never been proved in, in 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 space, and the idea is to put a cubesat and push out of it one of those tiny uh, 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 sail craft, less than hundred grams, um, with a sail attached to it, and point a laser from the uh, cubesat at this tiny sail craft. And the, the design goal is to, is to produce a 10 kilometer uh, orbital increase. So raise the orbit of the, of the, of the, the sail craft by, by 10 kilometers. Um, there's more on, on, on our website at that, at that link. Um, and I've got another, set, another presentation that goes into much more detail about glow worm. Um, here's some of the details. That, that image on the left done for the Andromeda project um, by Adrian Mann, who's one of our um, trust the artists who do these things. And the stuff on the right is the, the team at uh, Drexler University in Philadelphia who've been working on what they call Pinpoint, which is actually the sailcraft itself as distinct from the, from the CubeSat that it would be launched from and, and, and pushed by. Um, so what are the changes? Um, it's a little bit but it's, 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 it's how uh, um, Breakthrough Starshot people saw the problem a couple of years ago, and it's still pretty close to the, to the truth of what the challenges are. So first of all, you have the problems of launch, which is the bit in red. So um, how do you have a, a, a light beamer that you, you place on the surface of the Earth, which is what they want to do in order to do it relatively quickly, not in space. Um, 
how do you get the beams together? How do you overcome atmospheric effects? How do you keep the damn thing cool? Um, how do you keep it pointing precisely at the spacecraft? Um, and you've got to uh, uh, also keep it pointing as, as it's accelerated as well. Um, you've got to aim the, aim the trajectory very, very accurately at the exoplanet. You don't get much chance for um, uh, adjustment in, in, in trajectory once you've done the initial push with the big laser. Um, will the sail pull together under thrust? Will the sail be stable in the beam? What do you do about all that interstellar, interstellar dust and even the interplanetary dust that it must pass through? Because um, the idea is that this thing travels at 20% of the speed of light and just about anything hitting you at 20% of the speed of light is going to go off with a bit of a bang. Um, so uh, you've then got to deal with uh, the interstellar medium um, and in particular cosmic rays. Uh, so that's uh, something that you don't encounter much in low Earth orbit. Uh, you've got to maintain functionality over, over decades. And this is a chip set, remember, it's tiny, absolutely tiny. Um, we can build probes like uh, New Horizons that go out to Pluto and that can survive, but they're half a ton and that sort of thing. This is a chip set. Um, you've got to be able to point a camera at the planet because what Yuri Milner wants is a close-up picture of an Earth-like planet around another star. That, that's his, his sort of fundamental design objective obviously they're going to do a lot of science but that, that that's that's the that's the real test that's his key performance indicator um you've then got to point a transmitter back at earth to get the data back because unless you transmit some data back how do you how do you know you got there um and you've got to send those images probably using a laser rather than radio um and you probably need to use the sail or what's left of it as, as some kind of a reflector to, to give you a, a decent antenna, um, or actually telescope, you could say, given that, it, that it's basically optical. Uh, can you receive? Can you use the light beam to receive the images? Because it's a big structure, and you could uh, scale the, the uh, um, your receiving station in the same way as the light beam. How do you generate the power? Because the amount of power, the impulse power, is enormous, and you need to store it for the for the relatively small number of minutes. Push. Um, uh, the components at gram scale, um, they call it Starship. Launch safety, what about that, that multi hundred gigawatt beam? Um, space debris will get in the way. And there's the whole question of, of will, it, will it fly politically? Policy issues, basically. So there's a lot of things that stand in the way of this, but they're, they're, these guys are powering on using Euro Miller's money. Um, a lot of people at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and uh, one of the leaders is at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. I'll get to him in a minute. Um, so just taking a pace back, what is the big picture uh, of all the various means that we might use um, to, to get to the stars? And we're focusing at the moment on, on uh, uh, mass type systems, uh, mass drivers, particle beams, electric, the square at the top left hand corner and there's Starkovsky's rugged equation up above it and uh, uh, various push based systems but there are, there are other ways of doing it and uh, um, our co-founder Kelvin Long did this diagram quite a few years ago and what he was um, what is your um, energy source for propulsion so you have mass driven up at the top so the energy, energy source is at the origin, we're not carrying propellant, so that's like laser push. Um, on the left hand side you've got uh, energy source on the ship, on the bit itself. So that's like uh, electric propulsion and fusion and, and all that sort of thing down the left hand side. Um, you've then got a, um, trying to pick up energy on route, um, so things like the Bussard ramjet, um, Weird things like like inertia drives and, and uh, things like Mach effect thrusters. That's Mach as an M A C H. Um, uh, Mach's principle is 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 a real mind boggler if, you, if, you, if you've ever run into it. It's worth uh, worth looking at. Uh, Einstein thought it was it, it, it held, but it, it seems a bit meta, uh, metaphysical to me. But uh, I'm just a humble engineer. Um, along the bottom line. Uh, uh, 
characterized as time-driven designs. So things like uh, skipping past the problem of the distance by using wormholes and warp drives uh, and some other stuff like that. Uh, and the one that interests me is that one at the bottom left, information travel. And um, I've trailed that enough already. But that's the, that's the whole spectrum, a taxonomy really, of, of all the various ways that you might do it. Um, so let's just think about that uh, artificial intelligence um, uh, way of doing things. Can we go ourselves, world ships, uh, AI or some kind of Star Trek like drive? Um, if we can't go ourselves, will our artificial general intelligence, and by that I mean artificial intelligence that is of human capability, and that's the term that's used, artificial general intelligence. What we don't have at the moment, we have various things that are called artificial intelligence, but we don't have anything that's remotely close to what a human can do. Um, and there's some basic principles involved in that um, that I tried to investigate in the piece that I wrote for Principium several years ago in two parts. And there's the reference to it over on the right. You start off with the Church Turing thesis, which is that all computing machines are equivalent. So that the, the dumbest microprocessor, I can remember four bit microprocessors back in, in the early 80s. Um, so uh, the dumbest microprocessor, uh, uh, all the way through to the biggest computer that, that has ever been conceived or, or is, is possible to conceive, are all essentially equivalent. And that's what the Church Turing thesis says. That's, that's uh, Alonzo Church in the USA and Alan Turing in the UK in, in the late 1930s. And then we get to another of, of Turing's ideas, and it's sometimes called the Turing test. But if you read Turing's paper in mind in the 1950, I think it was, or 51, um, what he talks about is, is the politeness principle. In other words, if something behaves as if it has general intelligence, then it is polite to treat it as such. Um, and you don't have to know what's happening inside it. And if you look at machine, um, machine learning systems now, which is the most powerful artificial intelligence we have at the moment. Machine learning systems are quite inscrutable. Um, it's quite hard for the, for, for, for the likes of the guys at, at uh, Google DeepMind in London um, to, to figure out what their systems are doing when they're beating the best Go player in the world and, and all those other clever things they do. Um, hard to tell what's going on inside. If machines like that start to exhibit human levels of, of, of apparent intelligence, then what Aunt Turing said back in 1950 is it's polite to treat them as intelligent. Because at the bottom of that is, is an old philosophical problem, which is how do you know that other people have inner lives? How do you know that other people have minds of their own? How do you know they're not robots or zombies? Um, so there's the, we get into philosophical stuff there. But, um, Certainly, Arthur Clarke believed that creatures in flesh and blood such as ourselves can explore space and win control over what he called infinitesimal fractions. But only creatures of metal and plastic can really conquer it. Um, and this is back in 1962. Um, I'm just going to try and play that. I've, I've got a, an artificial voice of Arthur Clarke. It quite often doesn't work. So if it doesn't work, then um, it... Uh, Let's see if that works. Creatures of flesh and blood such as ourselves can explore space and win control over infinitesimal fractions of it. But only creatures of metal and plastic can ever really conquer it, as indeed they have already started to do. The tiny brains of our mariners and pioneers barely think of the mechanical intelligences that will one day be launched at the stars. Now, I don't know if that worked. I could hear it, but maybe you couldn't. Uh, anyway, that's 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 what he said. Um, so he, uh, Arthur Clarke uh, was quite sceptical about um, the possibility of, of actual humans going to the stars. Anyway, moving on. So that that's sort of covered the patch. Um, I'm going to give you a whole lot of references uh, to, to look things up further. Um, and um, here they come. Uh, so thought and propulsion. Um, uh, Sarkovsky thought of it. Um, that's a piece I wrote for Principium back in 2018 about uh, 
Salkowski's inter interstellar thinking. Um, so take a look at that if Salkowski interests you. It's got lots of references to proper texts on Salkowski's work. Um, so that might be a starting point. Um, uh, Robert Forward, Hughes Corporation. That's his laser push paper. Um, that's an, an open access version of his laser push paper. It's not too demanding. You've got a bit of physics. Um, what really got things started with with um, the the uh, the current um, uh, breakthrough Starshot uh, laser push uh, way of doing interstellar travel with tiny tiny uh, star chip as they call them was was, was a, a paper um, paper written by Prof Lubin at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Um, which he published in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. The BIS has always been strong on, on interstellar stuff uh, since way before the Daedalus work. Um, uh, JBIS is, is paywalled, so you have to subscribe to it. But the paper is published by a NASA site there, so there's a link to it. Uh, Zach Burkhart's one of the, one of the uh, um, Project Glowworm team. And he, he, he wrote a piece um, and presented at the International Astronautical Congress in 2018 in Bremen. Um, that's his paper about, about the glow world. So that's the photon propulsion bit. Um, and then a couple of things that, that um, relate to that. Uh, the Andromeda study, which I told you about. Uh, so Andreas Hein, our technical director, was the lead author on this, but not the only one. There's an open publication version of that. Um, the best starting paper about Brexit Breakthrough Starshot was that, is actually written by a guy called Kevin Park. He was a Brit, actually, um, who's, who's uh, based in California. Um, and that system model paper is, is, is a really good introduction. It's, it's a, a basic piece of engineering, how you might make the whole thing fit together. It covers the whole idea of the Starshot probe. Um, and it's reasonably accessible if you've got a bit of physics. Um, I talked about the Icarus Firefly Z pinch thing, and there's an introduction to it in again in Principium, written by my um, fellow editor Patrick Mann, who's a proper physicist. Um, so that's uh, that might be of interest if you want to carry on with that. Um, and uh, there's a survey paper that uh, Rob Swinney published in Acta Futura, which is the the uh, the ESA uh, advanced technology. Um, publication. So the link to that at the bottom. Um, and then there's the, the Project Daedalus papers, which, and, and that link will take you to the BIS website where you can buy a copy of the book with all the papers in it. Um, I've got two copies, just about everybody who's involved in this sort of thing has at least one copy of, of the Project Daedalus papers. Um, some books web and films. Uh, the, the grandiad of them all is, is Greg Matloff. He's still around. He's a, he's an emeritus professor at um, uh, um, uh, City of New York University. Uh, and he wrote the, the classic introductory text published in 1981 about how you can do interstellar propulsion. Um, our co-founder Kelvin Rong wrote, wrote a much more detailed book much more recently. And that's still probably the most comprehensive book on the subject. Um, uh, Rachel Armstrong, who was involved with our work in the very early early days, is, is uh, has been some years now professor of experimental architecture at Newcastle University, and, and she uh, put a book together called Star Art, and that's that's really a dream about about uh, how a starship might work. Uh, she's very interested in the relationship between biological systems and buildings. Um, bit of a weird thinker, but interesting stuff. Lots of web links there. So um, Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop. I need to change that. They've changed their name. So TBIW.us. So the BIS, you know, Tau Zero Foundation, I've, I've already mentioned. Uh, and there's a, the, a link to the Breakthrough Starshot um, main website. And there's that, that edition of the ESA uh, journal, Act of Futura. Um, that was the interstellar issue, their first interstellar issue. Um, and uh, films not about probes yet. Um, I guess probably quite a few people have seen those two uh, films. Interstellar is the one with the heavy physics, uh, with a bit of help from, from a UK uh, uh, CGI company called Double Negative. Uh, 
Kip Thorne actually in his book, The Science of Interstellar, uh, tells us that, that working with double negative allowed him to visualize some things in physics that he, that he wasn't able to visualize before. So uh, the movie industry helping, uh, helping a physicist as well as the other way around. Passages I, I, I really like, it's, it, it has mixed opinions, um, but is it, is it realistic? Uh, the propulsion is pretty dodgy, uh, but I just like I just like the way the damn thing rotates. Which, uh, uh, so what else does I fry us do? We we um, we have those projects. Dragonfly was the original laser push. Andromeda, which we did for Breakthrough Starshot. Project Lyra, um, which I think I've, I've talked about before, is is uh, about reaching interstellar objects, in particular uh, Oumuamua, which is still a mystery. A glow worm, which I've talked about on Pinpoint. Um, we do a lot of academic and outreach, so we do quite a bit of peer reviewed publication. Uh, so just poke those two terms, I for eyes and Stellar, into, into Google Scholar and you'll find our stuff. Um, we do cooperation with the universities, quite a few, uh, um, some in the, in the uh, UK, notably uh, York University fairly recently. Um, and for years we've done a, 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 an annual elective for the student, uh, the Master of Space Studies students at the International Space University, that's the ISU, um, in, uh, in Strasbourg. Um, and those are really inspiring. You've got young people who've just finished their first degrees and they're doing a Master's in Space Studies. And we really, we really hope we inspire them to get interested in the whole interstellar thing. Astronomical societies like yours and schools uh, worldwide. Astro socks only in the UK so far, but we've done some schools work um, in countries as, as wide as the USA and Vietnam. Uh, we did a series at the Royal Institution. That's all on hold now because of the virus, unfortunately. Uh, and we're doing a current talk series, some of which are public, some of which are members only. But there's the link to it. I'm pretty happy my because I'm uh, and it's free, and there's the link to it. And there's a couple of nice covers. Um, the one on the left is, is uh, by David Hardy, and it's the, it's the um, uh, Parker Solar Probe uh, envisaged. And the one on the right is by Michel Antonio, who's the guy who worked on the Z Bridge idea, and it's his idea of how um, the, the uh, Icarus Firefly vehicle would look while it was being assembled in orbit. Uh, and so that's us. Um, there's all the links to us. Uh, we're two nominally separate organisations for sort of regulatory reasons, but we're really one organisation. And we're on Facebook, of course, and LinkedIn. Uh, that's how to get to Principium. And uh, so we go to comments and questions, and I'll stop sharing. I hope that was interesting. That's fantastic, John, and I think we should all show our appreciation. Thank you really very much indeed. Um, I would like to kick off with a question about the, the, the laser technology in pushing a probe out. Um, yeah. I'm assuming that sure. even the laser has to, the light from the laser follows the inverse square law. So the, the actual power delivered is going to drop off very quickly. I mean, it, is that not going to weaken until it, there's no that, effect? That's, that's a problem that is not very significant for the Breakthrough Starshot um, idea, because they want to do it fairly quickly, and they therefore want to locate the, the laser bank. We're talking about 200 gigawatts of lasers here. This is mind-boggling powers. Um, they want to put it on the Earth's surface. Now, if you think about it for, for uh, uh, no more than a few seconds, it'll strike you that the Earth has the unfortunate habit of rotating uh, and therefore keeping your beam pointed at, at, a, at a, a vehicle that's heading in a straight line out to Alpha Centauri is going to be rather difficult for more than a few minutes or at least an hour or two at the very most. So the inverse square law is not going to cause you that much problem. Um, you're, it, it, even at 20% of the speed of light, the, the distance it travels in, in that very small number of minutes probably um, is not going to make that much difference. Um, if, if you start talking about, about accelerating more gently and using, for example, a space-based laser bank, then yes, you, you, you start to, to um, worry about that sort of thing. And in fact, um, 
some of the ideas around laser push or microwave beam push in, in some of the early studies suggested that you, you should build a series of gigantic uh, Fresnel lenses uh, to keep the beam concentrated. Um, so that would be overcoming the inverse squaring uh, law, but you're dead right. Um, um, the, the, the inverse square law uh, impacts an area I'm rather more interested in personally, which is communications, because that's my old professional subject. Uh, and of course, um, the, the, in, the inverse square law applies to the downlink as well. So when you try to transmit data back from this tiny starship, um, you've got four light years, um, the effect of four light years squared. Um, and uh, I've, I've, I've got a, a presentation about that, which I did uh, call the interstellar downlink um, uh, that's on, on our website. I think it's on open access. It's one of the open access ones. So if you want to take a look at that. Um, yeah, so the inverse square law, not so bad for Project Starshot, more difficult if you want to accelerate more gently and certainly a problem for the, the downlink. Um, yeah, it's a long way. Okay, thanks. Um, anyone else? John, yeah. Uh, just to, uh, your second slide actually amazed me. Uh, it had the uh, alt cloud at, at something like one light year in size. Then, what, if you actually what, what, sorry, what was one light year in size? Uh, is it the alt cloud, the furthest one? Or I no, the alt cloud. Well, the alt cloud isn't isn't anything like a light year. Um, it, it's it's uh, uh, where it starts anyway. I think the, the, the suspicion, I'm not, I'm not sure this is really known. You you guys are the astronomers, you maybe know better than I do, but I, my belief that the Oort cloud maybe extends out to to uh, uh, about halfway to Alpha Centauri. If you looked at that slide two of yours, it looked yeah, like it, it, Alpha it, it Centauri, like yeah, yeah. If, you had, if Alpha Centauri had the same as us, the two Oort clouds would actually interact. Indeed, that's true. That struck me several times and I, I I've never got around to asking an astronomer if that might be true. So, um, I'll, I'll, as like like the cheeky teacher, I'll, I'll I'll leave that leave that to the students to tell me because you guys know more about astronomy than I do. <laughs> I'm not really an astronomer. I I, I was in the astrosoc at university, um, but I was always more interested in the in the in the in the uh, the mechanisms and the electronics and all that stuff than in the stars themselves. I I. I've, lots of friends who, who are nuts about astronomy particularly astrophotography now that it's so works so well with, with uh, modern equipment and, and computers and stuff um, and i admire what they do but i, I i'm really an engineer i want to make things happen uh, um, I, saw, I, I sort of love astronomy at a distance rather than uh, as, a, as a practitioner john yeah um you mentioned the problems of interstellar dust, interstellar uh, matter, yeah. and the speed of the the probe travelling. Yeah. But how do you go about fixing the problem? You need uh, to take it into account. You need to you need to think about the material that you're making the thing out of, and you need to shield it in some way. Um, if you remember that image of of, of uh, uh, the Daedalus probe. Uh, uh, right at the front was that rather sort of flat tin can shaped thing. Yeah, the shield. And that was that's the beryllium shield. And and one of the papers in uh, the, the BIS book is is essentially concerned entirely with the, with the business of, of sh shielding the damn thing at twelve percent of the speed of light. Now the breakthrough Starshot guys want to go at the 20% of the speed of light and they're talking about something a lot more fragile than that 500 ton Daedalus payload. Um, so that, that is definitely one of their challenges and I, and I, I listed all those challenges for you and, and, and they, they really do have to worry about that. It's, it's, uh, it, it ain't simple. But, uh... Can I ask um, a sort of a question about obviously the technology is, is mind boggling, but yeah. before that, I mean, could we not build a huge 
sort of telescope array in orbit with maybe some, lots of small elements that build up to something huge resolution at least have a good look um, in the direction of these nearer star systems to see you know if there is anything and get spectrums and all that which um, obviously the technology do that but it's not quite as you know extreme as some are actually trying to go there as a sort I, of interim I, step. I I I I I, I think you're right, and a, a lot of, of astronomers argue that, and they say um, that, that uh, um, you know, it, it's 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 not to, uh, sensible to spend a lot of money uh, going there when you just need to build bigger and bigger telescopes. the The evidence against that is is um, pretty clear, um, and that is uh, New Horizons. You look at new, what New Horizons brought brought back from Pluto. Compare that with the best telescopes we we've, we've got, um, and you uh, those images of the surface of Pluto. And it isn't just pictures. If you get that close, you can not only make the pictures a lot better, but you can uh, you can do all the other science so much better from nearby than you you can with 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 a telescope. And if that applies. At, at a distance of Pluto, which is you know, the, the backyard, basically, um, comparatively, then uh, it applies, uh, you know, a, a thousandfold for for a, for a probe to the stars. Um, I, I think the argument there is is is, you know, there's, there is arguments on both sides, but I, the evidence of our experience with solar system probes is is that. Probes can do what telescopes can't do at any given level of technology. Um, maybe in a hundred yeah. years we'll, we'll have telescopes that are um, good enough to to uh, to see planets around distant stars at, at the same resolution as, as New Horizons saw Pluto. Uh, John, isn't the argument that the telescope isn't the argument that the telescopes used to identify potential targets to go and visit um, so you have the best uh, re resolving telescopes that you, you can build i mean we've got james webb coming on and then we'll have even oh. bigger and better ones so yeah. that you can look to see if there are planets there and even do spectroscopic analysis of the planets and then make the final decision that indeed. that's the target indeed. to send out the probe indeed and 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 one of the one of the uh, slight flies in the ointment of the whole uh, uh, breakthrough starshot thing which which wants to do it quick you know personally i'm i'm i i, I applaud the breakthrough starshot guys and they're doing great work and all the work they're doing about the feasibility of these things will be useful in the long run i i'm skeptical about um whether um they can achieve um things in 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 those time scales Thing is, Yuri Milner wants this to happen during his lifetime. Now he's a relatively young man. I think he's probably about on the forty mark. Um, but can this be done within the next forty or fifty years? I am sceptical, um, and I also think that that it's a bit like uh, um, when Trump was in office. He was determined that that he would get himself a second term and that he'd got he'd, he'd have Americans back on the surface of the moon before the end of his second term. And he, he pushed Bridenstine, the NASA administrator, really hard to try and achieve that. But I don't think anybody in NASA really believed it was realistic. Um, they, they, they basically said, uh, yes, Mr. President, you know, you, you, you give us the books and we'll try. But I think there were many, many people who thought it was, it, it was not feasible. So we're, we're sort of in that position. The guy who's got the money wants to do it in his lifetime. Um, and as a result, I think he will achieve some some tremendous uh, leaps forward in the technology, which will be immensely useful in the long run. But I don't think it's going to happen in his lifetime. I, I hope I'm wrong. Um, certainly not going to happen in my lifetime, but I'm a lot older than him. Um, yeah. So, Having mentioned New Horizons, it occurs to me, I mean, we've done this sort of interplanetary billiards to accelerate the spacecraft around to the outer parts of the solar system. Is there no one thinking that we could use the, the same interactions of planets backwards and forwards to finally achieve an escape velocity? It's certainly helpful. There is no doubt about that. And in fact, if you look at the Project Lyra work, the IFRS Project Lyra work, 
uh, intercepting something like Umumu is, is a, a hell of a challenge. You need a lot of delta V, as the uh, rocket engineers put it. Um, and one of the ways of achieving that um, is, is by those sort of slingshot maneuvers. But there's an even more uh, powerful thing you can do, and that's called an Oberth maneuver. And um, what that is, is, is it's using the fact that, that uh, uh, kinetic energy is half mv squared, basically. What that, what that, the consequence of that is that, is that um, if, you, if you're traveling at a relatively high velocity already and you, and you, uh, um, you fire your rocket, then you get a lot more bang for your buck that way. And Herman Ober, Ober, Herman Ober did, the, did the, uh, the sums on this back in the 1920s. He was one of the originators of the German Rocket Society. And he calculated that, that for example, if you looped close around the sun and you fired your rocket at, at perihelion, then you'd get a hell of a, uh, an impulse. Um, and the Project Lyra studies, there's a, there's a guy called Adam Hibbard who works with us, who's, who's a, a, a brilliant practical mathematician. He's written a software package that, that, that lets IFRIS do this sort of thing. And he's done a, 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 the mathematical aspects of the mission planning for Project Lyra. And, and he's shown that using things like Olberth and Nobles, um, including doing them around Jupiter, not just around the sun. Um, and in fact, uh, you remember I mentioned the Johns Hopkins uh, um, Applied Physics Laboratory guys in, in, uh, in the USA. Um, they have a project uh, with NASA, currently um, under review at NASA, and they call it the Interstellar Probe. It's not an Interstellar Probe, it's a sort of super voyager. And it's interstellar in the sense that it will inv investigate the interstellar medium out, out beyond, the beyond the heliosphere. And the way they want to do that is by, by doing one of those orbit maneuvers. And they've worked out that um, if you use a, a shielding similar to the, to the Parker Solar Probe, uh, which you've probably heard of, um, that's, that's got heavy shielding to protect it from the sun so they can fly close to it. In the case of the Parker Solar Probe to do observations of the sun, in the case of the, of the interstellar probe of the JHUAPL people, they want to get close to the sun to do an orbit maneuver. Um, and their idea is, is that you can get out beyond uh, um, the heliosphere in about 10 years, instead of, instead of taking uh, 40 years like the Voyagers. Um, and of course, New Horizons is nowhere near that yet. Um, it did a slingshot, if not several, I think. But uh, you can get a lot more bang by going around the sun. But then you've got to factor in the, the, the problem of having to, having to carry a shield to stop you from being frazzled by the sun. So um, you win some, you lose some. But yeah, uh, slingshotting is, is definitely helpful in, in uh, achieving the sort of velocity you want. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I have. All right, go no. on. Um, you've talked about the light sails and everything having to be very, very light. Yeah. But you've also got to get a um, method of transmitting back to Earth out there and that that's going to be very, very heavy because even if you do it with a laser, it's going to be a very, very large package or particularly very, very long package to keep the laser beam parallel. They, they're talking about using the, 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 the solar sail as effectively a reflecting telescope. Um, so you, you point your little laser in your, in your chipset um, at, at your solar sail, at your light sail, um, if you can preserve it, uh, and if it's if it's the right shape, then it will act as a as a as a, as a reflector and, and and concentrate your beam. Um, and if you look at my uh, piece in 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 Precipium, and it's 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 also available as a separate paper online. I don't have the, the reference right now, but I, if anybody wants to ask me, I can I can send it. Um, and and the the work they've done, and in particular. Um, um, uh, Philip Lubin, the guy I mentioned before, who did one of the original studies, uh, David Meshmet from, from University of California, uh, Berkeley, um, and a guy whose name keeps going out of my head, but he's, he's uh, at Curtin University in Australia, have written some papers about the interstellar downlink from, from a star chip sized probe. Um, 
and also uh, Kevin Park in the Brit uh, has, has written a paper about that as well, all for breakthrough star shock. Um, and the challenges are very, very clear, but it is not impossible. Um, it, it, the, the, the might, there's a, a mind boggling amount of, of, of uh, uh, decibel losses, and it's mainly the inverse square law, the biggest factor. It's like, uh, uh, like minus 300 decibels. So that, that's a, um, 10 to the 30.0 uh, reduction in the, in the strength of your signal just by the distance. That's leaving aside all the problems like it has to come through the Earth's atmosphere if you're using terrestrial telescopes and the beam might be slightly off. Um, and where, where the devil do you get the power from? They're talking about a, a laser, laser powers of about one, one kilowatt, but that's one kilowatt uh, um, in the right direction. That's not one, one kilowatt isotropic. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's very challenging, but as yet, there is no absolute showstoppers, as far as I can see. But, but, uh, I can send you the reference to that piece that I wrote, um, and that's got references to the proper papers that are really... Uh, I'm just a science journalist in this context, uh, as I've said. It sounds like a reason for building Arecibo bigger and better next time round. Yeah, well, that's the sort of thing they're talking about. Um, and again, I, I, uh, my personal feeling is, is, is that you're much better waiting until you can build some big telescopes in space. Um, and one of the things that's coming uh, fairly soon, actually, I think, is starting to build things out of materials that are already there, uh, in particular asteroid material. <coughs> so building big structures out of a, a, uh, asteroid material. Um, and if by some means you can find the material to, 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 to make solar cells, um, then uh, you set up the, 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 the relevant automated manufacturing in, in um, somewhere where the material is, like a handy asteroid that's made of the right stuff. And you construct your, your great big telescope array, and also potentially your great big laser array to propel the thing in the first place as well. Um, but that's a lot further off than Yuri Milner wants to see it. So he's talking about uh, laser, laser beams from the ground and telescopes on the ground. Mm. Um, okay, Patrick, uh, I think you had a question. Yeah. Oh, you, you're saying about um, getting out to further distances. Why can't you just piggyback an asteroid or a comet that goes around the sun, get onto it and take you out and then get off when you need to? Yeah, but, uh, that would be fine if they went fast enough. Um, I, uh, there, there, I think, I don't know how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of years um, the... the um, that, for example, at Oumuamua uh, is going to take to get to the nearest star if it was pointed in the, wrong, in the right direction, which it isn't. Um, but uh, 40,000 years uh, before a uh, Voyager reaches, the, the two Voyagers reach the sort of distances of Alpha Centauri. Um, and, and they are travelling pretty fast. They're travelling a lot faster than, 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 uh, than your average comet. They're, they're, they're travelling at, at those interstellar speeds, they're travelling above the sun's escape velocity. And of course, so is a Oumuamua, but not by very much. Um, what about a short period one? Well, they, that's even slower. Um, they, they, uh, you, you need something that, 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 that's, that's going at a hell of a rate, because as soon as you start going away from the sun, the sun cut starts dragging you back, of course. <laughs> so you've got to, you've got to have enough uh, momentum in your vehicle, um, unless you can thrust continuously, you've got to have enough momentum in your vehicle to, to climb out of the sun's gravity well. If you think about it like that, think about the sun as having a great big gravity well, yeah. and we're all sitting in it. We're about halfway down the well or something like that, um, just for the sake of argument. Um, and of course, we're sitting at the bottom of the annoying gravity well here on Earth as well. There is so much more you can do if once you're out there in between the but you're still stuck with being uh, down the sun's gravity well. Um, so you need the momentum um, to get the speed. 
Oh, okay, thank you. Um, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Could you use entangled electrons to pass back data from so we don't have to have a great big... Um, yeah, yeah. quantum entanglement is, is, is quite often discussed in this context and uh, you, you find me even more ignorant on this subject, but my understanding is that you can't cheat uh, the light speed limitation using entanglement. The, the, the fact that two things are entangled means that they, they uh, what happens to one in some sense happens to another, but you can't make that thing happen. You can't uh, poke an electron somewhere near uh, the sun and, and have a, have a paired electron somewhere in Alpha Centauri that feels the poke. Um, That's what but, I thought the idea of entanglement was, the instantaneous I, 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 action at a distance. I, I, I don't think it works. I, I'm even more out of my depth here, but my, my understanding is that entanglement will not get you around that problem. Um, what you really need is, is uh, Ursula Le Guin's Ansible, to, as in the science fiction stories which gives you simultaneous transmission all over, all over the universe. <laughs> That's what you need. Um, that sounds like Star Trek subspace communication. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that is interesting is, is that um, one, of the, one of the speculations about wormholes is, is, is that the, the bigger the wormhole, the harder it is to create and the, and the more energy you need to create it. But what if you can create a wormhole if you've got enough energy to create a wormhole that's only just big enough to shine a light beam through. Because if you can do that, then you've got instantaneous communication between those two endpoints. Um, and that has been uh, talked about um, um, as, as a possibility. Um, you know, even if you can't get a probe through a wormhole or even a ship full of people, as in the film Interstellar, um, it, it doesn't take a very big uh, wormhole, but even a tiny wormhole it requires vast amounts of, of energy. Um, if you if you read Kip Thorne's book, The Science of Interstellar, then it's a pretty reasonable introduction to the to the subject. And it's written by a guy with a Nobel Prize for physics, so uh, it, it's pretty authoritative, I think. Um, one thing we do know about human ingenuity is if we can think about it, we normally do get around to doing it. Um, and I think you've laid out quite a lot of the problems we're going to face. So thank you for doing that. And hopefully um, we'll see this happen soon. But in the meantime, um, I'd like us all to thank you very much indeed right. and answering the questions. John, thank you very much. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, I, I, and, and best set of questions I've had for ages actually.